needed every one. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. If you have one, go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to welcome you all, especially those of you watching uh, online. This is our second week live streaming our services. And um, last week we, we did it. We had about 150 folks um, watching online from Hong Kong and Taiwan and um, the Bronx. It was, uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it was just wonderful to have uh, folks gather with us. Um, last week was Vision Sunday, and we focused on the theme of, of bridging barriers. And I mentioned that over the next few weeks, there are going to be walls that we're going to be addressing that uh, need to come down in Jesus' name. And the first wall that we're going to look at today is the political wall. And so I'm going to do today what they tell you not to do. Uh, especially on Thanksgiving. I'm going to be re mixing religion and politics together on a Sunday morning. And so uh, proceed with caution when you do this at home, okay? Um, and so we're going to look at this today. And the, the goal for today is, is not to tell you uh, who to vote for. The goal is, is really to help us approach this election season with a prophetic imagination. Uh, the goal is to see politics through the lens of Jesus, not see Jesus through the lens of politics. There's a big difference there. How do we see politics through the lens of Jesus and not see Jesus through the lens of politics? And there's so much I, I want to say, but I trust that God's word will be sufficient for us today. And so Corinthians chapter 1, we'll get there in a moment. Let's pray. Let's invite the Spirit of God to speak to us, to move in us and through us as we look at this passage. Father, thank you for gathering us in this space. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. Move us, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, that we would receive every gift you have for us this day. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. This past week, I immersed myself in a study a research out of Stanford University and Princeton University. And the paper was, of this study was entitled, Fear and Loathing Across Party Lines, New Evidence of Group Polarization. And the premise of the study was that polarization as a result of political hostility is at an all-time high. And so this summary, they had a summary statement. There were maybe 50, 60 pages, if I recall. And the summary statement was, was pretty eye-opening. And this is what they concluded. They said, our evidence demonstrates that hostile, remember that word from last week, hostile feelings for the opposing party are ingrained or automatic in voters' minds. And that effective polarization based on party is just as strong as polarization based on race. Now, this study reveals the hostility that's present, but there is one thing that was actually surprising in the New York Times in an article on this study that stated that in 1960, when they asked parents, who would you be most upset with if your, parent, if your child married, the answer was two groups of people. If, you, if they married someone from a different race or they married someone from a different religion, they would be very upset. In 2010, they did a very similar study, and they concluded that what would what what make parents most upset in 2010 would be if their child married someone from a different political party. <laughs> and so when it comes to the walls of politics, the walls are very thick. These are not flimsy walls here. This is not some sheetrock here you can just bang. These are some thick walls walls of hostility. And so we learned last week that the cross of Jesus isn't just the bridge that gets us to God, it's a sledgehammer that breaks down every wall of hostility. That the cross is not just to get us over to God, the cross is to get us to each other. It is a sledgehammer that to break down walls that separate us. And so the cross of Jesus, as we're gonna see today, is powerful enough to break down political walls of hostility. 
And this is what Paul is getting at in this passage, and this is what Paul is getting at in last week's passage. So last week's passage was served as the the passage that undergird everything we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. This is what Paul says. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their Hostility. That's Paul in Ephesians. This is our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you, may, you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I meditated on this and gave my own translation of this passage here. Take a listen. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, had inboxed me on Facebook telling me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Trump. Another, I follow Hillary. Another, I follow Bernie. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Trump crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Hillary? The answer is no. The answer is no. (laughs) One of the reasons I love reading 1 Corinthians is because it's filled with drama. And for many of us, when we see people with troubles in their own lives, it leads to a kind of unhealthy joy. Misery loves company because we say, I'm not the only one who has problems here. This is wonderful to see somebody else struggling. When you look at the, first, the church in 1 Corinthians, you watch it because there's this like drama that's taking place. The Corinthian church is probably the church that Paul had most problems with. They were an incredibly gifted church, but they lacked maturity. They lacked character. They lacked love. And one of the things you come up, you see in Scripture over and over again, it doesn't matter how gifted you are, if you have no love, you're nothing. If It doesn't matter how much uh, gifts and accomplishments, if you don't have maturity, if you don't have character, if you don't have love, it doesn't matter. No matter what your level of education, no matter what your annual salary, no matter what neighborhood you live in, no matter what accomplishments and achievements you have, if you don't have maturity, if you don't have character, if you don't have love, it really doesn't mean anything. And so throughout the book of Corinthians, Paul has had to address over and over issues of maturity with their church, and they had lots and lots of issues. They always were fighting with each other. Fighting with about who's most spiritual. Fighting about the communion table. Fighting about uh, food and idols. They are a mess. And in light of these tensions, we see that the main reason why this church had their issues stems from chapter 1. We see the root issue that, that Paul is addressing is division in the church. And so Paul says in verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you. And the way this division manifested is the way that these uh, congregants uh, divided according to leader. 
And so Paul says in verse 12, what I mean is this. Some of you say, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Another, I follow Christ. What's interesting to note about this uh, church is that the divisions did not lead to a church split. Paul is writing to one church that has four different groups inside of it. Four different divisions, four different cliques, four different factions, four types of groups. The first group were those who were loyal to Paul. Their campaign slogan was, we are of Paul. When you drove past their home, uh, they had signs in the front of their lawn that said, vote for Paul. And you would think this would make Paul happy. Like they say, Paul, we, we have, we have a view, and, and Paul is not happy by this. Paul is angered by this. The second group was a group that was of Apollos. And their campaign slogan was, we are of Apollos. And Apollos was this amazing and eloquent preacher. He can, he can preach the Old Testament like no one else could. People love to hear him preach. And so they said, we are of Apollos. The third group said, we are of Cephas, which means Peter. We are of Peter. And many were saying, later for Paul, later for Apollos, we need to get back to where this all started. It started with Jesus and with Peter. Peter is our God. And then interestingly enough, there's a fourth group of people. And they say, it's, it's a bit puzzling because they say, it's, we are of Christ. And yet Paul includes them with this faction. Their campaign is Jesus for president. But Paul strangely includes this group into his list, and he's not happy about it. Now, Paul uh, probably came across these people not because they had the wrong slogan, but because they had the wrong spirit. They had the right slogan. They probably had the wrong spirit. This group probably had with a, a little bit of smugness, a little bit of self-righteousness. That we, we are of Jesus. There's always a group of people that say, no, no, we're the purest. We're the righteous. We are of Christ. And Paul sees right through them. And so this passage here in Corinthians is not just a, 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 a letter here. It's a mirror for our lives. It's a mirror for our church. It's a mirror for our country. Because we live in perhaps the most polarizing and divisive time in our country. And a lot of the divisiveness and the intensity of it has come because of access to technology and social media. Social media has given everyone a platform to share what they think. And so we know more and more what other people think. We see more and more what other people like. Their words are accessible to us. And so in the news on social media, we see over and over again how divisions come to the surface. We see churches and Christians say we are for Trump. We see uh, churches and Christians say we are for Hillary. And the consequence of this polarization has been intense anxiety, anger, and attacking. Uh, Dan Rather, who a uh, famous news reporter on CBS, he was uh, interviewed earlier this year, and he was contrasting uh, this year with 1968. And he said 1968 was the year closest to what we're experiencing here in 2016. The country really felt wrecked at times. Anti-war demonstrations and the assassinations of not only President John Kennedy, but Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, there were race riots in the streets. He felt that uneasiness, and we feel the uneasiness today. And with all this divisiveness, with all this polarization, God has a clear word for us. The temptation we all have is to look at Jesus through political lens, uh, political views, and not look at our political views through the lens of Jesus. And Paul is trying to get the Corinthian church to adjust their approach and for us to address, uh, address our approach. And Paul gives a command to this church which sounds like fantasy land. It sounds impossible. It sounds irrational. It sounds like a fairy tale. Paul's word to the Corinthian church and God's word to us today is in verse 10 where he says, be of the same mind. Listen to what Paul says as I was reading this this week. I was laughing as I was reading this because of how ludicrous this sounds. 
I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say. I laughed this week reading this. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, a couple of things. Paul is appealing to the church to be united. Now, this does not mean that Paul wants everyone to think alike. It doesn't mean, if Paul were speaking here, that Paul wants everyone to vote alike. Because what Paul is not getting at is not uniformity. Paul is getting at unity. And there's a big difference. If I came here and said, you need to think like this and do this, now we're talking about a cult. Paul is not getting at uniformity. Paul is getting at unity. And so the question is, have the same mind about what? And that's a good question, but it's not specific enough. Because when Paul says have the same mind, he's not thinking about a what. When Paul says have the same mind, he's thinking about a who. Have the same mind about Jesus. Now, what are we to think about Jesus? Paul lays it out for us. Essentially, Paul is saying that our identity and our fundamental imagination is to be united in what Christ has done and with who Christ is. Who is Christ? Jesus is Lord. And so Paul says these words, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And when Paul says these three questions, he's looking for the church to redirect their imagination, to redirect their mind, to redirect their hearts. He's saying to the Corinthians, you guys have spent a lot of time and wasted a lot of emotional energy focusing on these leaders. And if Paul were here, he'd say to us, you've spent a lot of time and wasted a lot of energy focusing on these leaders. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? To which the answer is no. Paul is basically saying your primary allegiance is to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Your, let me say it again. Your primary allegiance is to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Now, this doesn't mean that you are uh, politically naive. It doesn't mean that you are uninformed. It means, however, that we are to be united in our allegiance. That we are not, our allegiance is not to a person. Primarily, our allegiance is not to our country. Our allegiance is primarily to Jesus Christ. And so Paul uses language that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when Paul uses this language, he's not just talking about salvation in some vague kind of afterlife sort of a way. When Paul says that Jesus is Lord, it has political ramifications. Because when Paul says that, in ancient times, the Caesar, when he would walk into a, a room, when he would walk into his palace, they had to greet him with the phrase, Caesar is Lord. N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, says that the emperor was the curios, the lord of the world, the one who claimed the allegiance and loyalty of subjects throughout his wide empire. When Paul is saying Jesus is Lord, he's not just talking about the afterlife. When Paul says Jesus is Lord, he's talking about this life too. And so to say that Jesus is Lord is to say that Caesar is not. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say the Republican Party is not. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say the Democratic Party is not. To say that Jesus is Lord is to say the Independent Party, the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, the Blue Party, the Yellow Party, whatever party there is out there is not. Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so Paul <laughs> writes... Jesus is Lord. Now, what does it mean to live it out? We are to be in one mind and in one heart confessing and agreeing that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Now, if I were to ask you, do you believe Jesus Christ is Lord? You would say, of course I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. If I were to ask any Christian around the country, do you believe Jesus Christ is Lord? We're going to say, absolutely. But you can believe it in your mind and live a totally different way. It's possible to pass the theology test and fail at following Jesus. It's one thing to say, I believe Jesus is Lord. It's another way to actually live that reality out. And so how do you know you truly believe Jesus is Lord in this politically hostile world? How do you know? Well, I want to give you seven ways. I had 20, but I said I had to narrow it down. And may this be the grid by which you approach election day. May this be the grid by which you approach conversation. How do you really know that you believe Jesus Christ and Lord? If I said to everyone, do you believe it? Yes. How do you prove it in this politically hostile world? Let me give you seven ways. Number one, you know that you trust Jesus is Lord in this hostile political season when whoever gets elected, you're not paralyzed with anxiety. Whoever gets elected, you're not paralyzed. Operative word is paralyzed. <laughs> Some of you, and you might feel disappointed or angry, a little bit nervous. But to truly trust that Jesus Christ is Lord, that whoever gets into that Oval Office doesn't change the fact that who's on the throne. that there is a rootedness to your life. That the world might be going crazy, but because you confess Jesus Christ is Lord, there is a rootedness to you. That you can, like Jesus, sleep in the boat amidst the storms that come your way. How do you know that Jesus Christ is Lord? Well, whoever gets elected, you're not paralyzed with anxiety. Number two, you know Jesus Christ is Lord when you Love and pray for those you disagree with. To confess Jesus Christ is Lord is to have your character shaped by the Lord. Now, many of us, uh, we have, listen, we have a hard time praying for a, a family member that we're upset with. And yet Jesus has the audacity in the Sermon on the Mount, which should be our founding document that the church looks at before anything else. Jesus has the audacity to say to pray for our enemies. We're going to really need the Holy Spirit for this one. God, God, help us. Love and pray. To confess Jesus is Lord is to have your character shaped by that Lord. That's how you know you believe Jesus is Lord. To, to confess Jesus is Lord means that you confess your limits and your blind spot. To say Jesus is Lord is not just to say Caesar is not, it's to say I am not. It's to say I have my own boundary blind spots, I have my own limitations. And in this politically hostile season, it's so easy to focus on the right side and the left side and forget to look into the inside. And so as followers of Jesus, there is a place for addressing the right side and the left side, but not to the degree that we don't look on the inside. As followers of Jesus know we have limits, we have blind spots, we have prejudice. We have our own issues that we need to be liberated from. To confess that Jesus is Lord means we also confess our limits and our blind spots. Number four. How do you know Jesus is Lord? Well, you don't anoint a candidate or party as God's candidate or party. Sadly, we've seen this in some of the charismatic churches and word of faith churches where they start anointing people. And every time I see pastors anointing politicians, it's a prostitution of power. Let me say it this way, that if a Christian fits neatly into any political party. That Christian does not fit neatly in the kingdom of God. If a, if a Christian fits neatly 
in any political party, that Christian does not fit neatly in the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't say you're not saved. I didn't say you're not going to heaven. I'm just saying, if you fit neatly in any party, you do not fit neatly in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is, stands outside of these parties and critiques these parties that do not line up with what the kingdom's ideals are. And so we do not anoint any candidate or party as God's party, as God's candidate. Number five. We well, you know we confess Jesus as Lord when the Lord's ethical concerns become your concerns. When you look at Matthew 25, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, when you see Jesus talk about the poor and the imprisoned and the refugee, when Jesus says, when you did this for the least of these, you did it for me. When the concerns of Jesus become our concerns as well, that lead the way of our spirituality and our ethics and our morals, then we can say, I truly confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Do the Lord's concerns, moral concerns, reflect your concerns. That's how you know you're confessing Jesus Christ is Lord. Number six, I had 20 on being easy on you guys. Number six, you know Jesus Christ is Lord when you spend more time listening to Jesus' voice than the prevailing voices. It's so easy to spend our entire day watching the news and allowing their narrative which is not neutral, I don't care what channel you watch, to shape story. And we spend so much time on Facebook and reading articles, and we're listening to all these voices, but when you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you make the space to listen to the Lord's voice, to cultivate that relationship, that intimacy. And may, may it be said of our lives, that if we have to choose between the news cycle or hearing from the Lord of hosts, that we turn the TV off and we listen to the Lord of hosts. We spend more time listening to the voice of Jesus than to prevailing voices. Seven is this. How do you know you truly believe Jesus Christ is Lord? Well, you live with a hope that makes no sense to the world. Whoever gets elected, may it be said of Christians that if your part can't, candidate gets elected or the other part get, get, gets elected, that you live with a hope that makes no sense to the world. And this is what I mentioned last week, that the church is to be a sign of hope, a sign of what is to come. And one of the ways that we show forth this hope is that we place our ultimate trust and our ultimate confidence in God. This is why Paul says at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians and verse 31, that if anyone is going to boast, they were boasting about leaders. He said, if anyone is going to boast, let that person boast in the Lord. It is only the Lord that deserves this kind of praise. It is only the Lord who can truly deliver us. It is only the Lord who can truly set us free. It is only the Lord who can turn this world around. And because only God can do it, we are called to boast in no one but Jesus. Vote for who you will, but boast in the Lord. Study the issues. Boast in the Lord. Cast your ballot. Boast in the Lord. And when it's all said and done, may we say like the psalmist said in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's magnify the Lord right now in this place. Lord, we give you praise in this place. We worship your name in this place. We boast in your name. We magnify your name. We glorify your name. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. 
You are the God most high. We will boast in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let me invite you to close your eyes. Have the worship team come forward. The church around this country has a lot of repenting and lamenting to do. A lot of repenting. We have too easily aligned ourselves with politicians, too easily aligned ourselves with power. We need to repent. Many of us in this room, we've aligned ourselves with parties in such a way that it has compromised our speech, compromised our hearts, and we have just contributed to the divisiveness instead of working for shalom. We need to repent. I want to give you a moment to confess your own repentance before God. And we'll sing together. But to confess Jesus Christ as Lord is to confess that we are not. That we are limited and that we need him. His forgiveness, his grace, his salvation. So I want to give you a moment to just, maybe your anger, maybe you've had rage, maybe you have not, invited Jesus into any conversations. And today is, Lord, we repent. Lord, we have kept you on the side while we've engaged in all these kind of conversations. But Lord, shape our imagination. May it be a prophetic imagination. Move us and shake us. Take about 30 seconds and then we'll sing in response, but Offer your own confession and repentance before God. Lord Jesus, you are alive and you are well. You are in this room through the power of your spirit. Lord, would you shape us, this community here at New Life, shape Christians around this country, those watching online. Shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. When they see the church, they see a community with the heart of Jesus, character of Jesus, the love of Jesus. Lord, may we speak out where we need to speak out, in ways that are inconsistent with your rule and reign. And may everything that comes out of our mouths ultimately be of love for you, love for neighbor, love for the world. We sing to you now, Lord, as a way of responding to your grace and power. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, let's all stand, let's sing together. Amen. Paul says, is Christ divided? The answer is no. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in Paul's name? It's Paul's way of saying baptism. What we saw today, earlier today, is, is when you get immersed in those waters, you belong to Jesus now. You belong to him. That's why I love full immersion. Every part of you belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. He dies for us, resurrects, seats us in heavenly places. Only God in Christ can do this. I want to invite our prayer team to come to my right. My hope is that uh, those seven signs, as you were, would be a grid for you. It's not everything, but it, hopefully it's a start. And every time you start getting anxious, 
and anxiety starts, oh, where are we going? Oh, Lord, we're going that way? That you realize, no, 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 Jesus is Lord. And when you're tempted to say something unkind, I know none of you are ever tempted that way in this, in this room. None of us, ever. But for those of us maybe watching online, <laughs> Whenever you're the temptation to say something that's inconsistent with the character of Jesus, that we would remember Jesus is Lord, and that confession is to shape my character. We are a sign of that which is to come. And so our prayer team will be here. We have the Lord's table as well. And maybe today you just you need help, you need grace, you need mercy, you need a filling of the Holy Spirit. You need an outpouring of the Spirit on your life, whatever it is. Some of you came into this church today. You're not even followers of Jesus. And Jesus Christ is calling you by name today. Calling you by name today. He knows your name. He's calling it. He's saying, come to me. And we have our prayer team that would love to pray with you and pray for you. And so as we close our gatherings, uh, let me invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. We do this every Sunday at New Life. It's a posture of receiving blessing. We cannot give what we have not received. And so we walk out of the, this building saying, Lord, we want to receive your blessing. And out of that, may we be the people of God that bless. And downstairs, we have our uh, sign-ups for different uh, opportunities to serve. And, and so as God leads you, you follow. But with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters, and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you belong to Jesus. And may your life reflect that awesome reality. And so I bless you all in the strong, beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.